Well, good morning. Welcome to our shepherd. We are so happy that you are here to worship our risen Savior this sunny morning. Uh, two quick announcements. Number one is the theme you're going to hear about peace. The sermon will be about that. Listen for that in the readings. And it's interesting that even in the Lord's Prayer, before he talks about the forgiveness of sins and the things that are eternal for us, he talks about give us our daily bread. Water's important too. So there was a time. 100 million people lack access to clean water. And it impacts every aspect of life. At any one moment in time, half of the world's hospital beds are filled with someone suffering from a waterborne disease. And this is the story of one of those people. Julia, who took me to her village's water source, it was this mud puddle. And as she scooped the water into her jerry can, she shared that she would use a piece of cloth to strain out what she could see wriggling in the water before she would take it home to her family. These are scenes that are common throughout rural Africa. Water sources are drainage ditches, ponds, swamps. It's the same water where they take their animals to drink. It's the same water where they used for washing and bathing. This mother shared she didn't have any other option. The solution is simple, a water well in the village, just like the ones you saw in the video and you see here. It provides clean, safe drinking water. It means that the people have access to increased health, improved health. The children can go to school. It provides hope for the future. The model of Water to Thrive is for each person, it only costs $10 to provide water, $70 for a family, $5,000 for an entire village to have clean water. At each village well, there's an elected water committee, and 50% of that water committee is female because they're responsible for gathering the water. We also train them on water sanitation and hygiene. And there's a maintenance fund, so when, if and when the well breaks, they have money to repair it. 
For the donors, we provide a plaque and they can put wording on the well. We provide the GPS coordinates, photos and stories of beneficiaries, and we invite you to go to Africa with us to visit your well. Since 2008, Water to Thrive donors have sponsored over 1,800 wells, providing water for 900,000 beneficiaries. This is one of those beneficiaries. She shared with me that she lost her two and a half year old son to a waterborne illness. I made a promise that day that Water to Thrive would continue working to provide clean water, and I invite you to join us to make sure other mothers don't lose their children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carl, thank you for bringing this forward and Suzanne for informing us. She will, they will be up in the Narthex. I uh, have a table there for more information, so please stop by, see how you possibly can help because this is a critical ministry. Thank you once again. And with that, let's rise for our opening hymn. name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please kneel for confession. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversations that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 4. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said, to any of the thing, said of any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle comes to, to us from 1 John, the first chapter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our own hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy God, if you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out, out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
We forgot to put the children come forward, and they're so obedient, they waited. But oh, when you see me sitting here, come on up. Good morning. When you come, make sure you look at the big stained glass. Find a door. Jesus says, peace be with you. When you think about some of the things that you experience when you have peace. Maybe safety, health, friendships renewed, satisfaction, a job is well done. There's a sense of calm and peace there. Maybe there's been reconciliation between you and another person. You're like, there's peace. There's a sense of completeness that everything that was incomplete, missing pieces, now has come together. One of the ambitions I have for this sermon is that maybe after the sermon, if you're asked to describe a peaceful place, it will be something other than just an empty, calm scene where there's no people. Because I think we have a problem with isolation. We have ambition that maybe when everybody's gone or all the troubles are away and I'm all by myself, then I can finally find peace. But I think isolation doesn't bring peace. It, the disciples are an illustration of this. There they are in Jerusalem. They've placed themselves in isolation from other people behind those doors and they are afraid. And I imagine that they are probably speaking conspiratorial threats and theories to each other. They're certain that people are searching for them. Even before the pandemic, the United States Surgeon General Vivek Murphy, Murphy said that our country is experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. And so he highlights that it has developed certain health issues that happen from a rise of a heart rate, blood pressure and blood sugar levels increasing, extra inflammatory cells being produced in that fight or flight response, that it may even be comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, the impact it has upon your health. And I think about some of these issues that he is identifying that happen in the body. They have some roots and some good things. It, I think it's a thing from God that our, our brains are equipped to kind of monitor for danger. That, that hair on the back of the head, you know, that just that neck that just rises in nervousness. Or, or maybe you've had that moment when you just, your spidey senses are going on. We are equipped to sense danger. But I think loneliness attenuates our ability to sense danger in the wrong direction. Subconsciously, loneliness, isolation, weak social networks, they all have consequences of tuning us to see fears and threats rather than seeing places where peace and trust can happen. Our isolation from God happens because of sin. Our isolation from one another happens because of sin. Whether it's the sin of others, it's a sin in our own hearts, we are being led further and further because of sin down into fear and anger, doubting and despairing. And I, I find this in my own life, that my own, that my own mind and my heart, I don't do well when I am apart from the people I love. Temptations, they become easier to justify. The, the conversations that I have in my head about what I think other people are saying or thinking, or maybe my thinking about what other people my words and how they've impacted them. If I don't have someone I love that I can kind of bounce that off of and say, did I hear this right or what do you think about this? If all it is is me, I, it's dangerous. I, I think I understand better through my own struggles in isolation and loneliness how Thomas, who's not with the disciples that first night, how he gets to that spot of a hardness of heart, how he gets to that place of unbelief. 
He, he's not in that room when Jesus appears. He's not in that room when Jesus speaks words of peace and shows the wounds in his hands and in his side. He's not there with the other disciples. His social network is weaker. His isolation has caused him to struggle to believe. He developed this stubborn unbelief, and I, I understand that. Because it's important to be with people, the families that we have that can provide emotional support, stability, the strength, the, the sense of backstop when we're weak, they can hold us up. That, that family support, it doesn't all, I mean, families, they can take many different forms. I, I find here in this own church we have here a, a family. Whatever your family looks like that provides that support that you need, when you don't have that system of support, when you're separated and apart and fear and despair starts to get more normal, I think you maybe find some understanding with Thomas, who's called the twin. The Bible illustrates the hidden hardness that can happen when we're alone. First of all, just know that we're created to be together. Genesis 2, God's created man, and he says it's not good for man to be alone. He brings forward for him to name all the animals, and not one of them is found to be a suitable helper for him. And so man is put into a deep sleep, and woman is there, and the man says, at last, there's... There's something fundamental about human connection, human companionship. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. I like that proverb because it speaks to the truth that if a person isolates themselves, our desires and our sound judgment all get clouded and messed up. 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul's got to describe the strength of the church with people many different gifts, the illustration he uses is a body. And then he talks about the danger when you dismiss certain parts of the body thinking you don't need them and how we are weaker because of that. That we need to find ways to see the strength of everybody that's a part of the body. One of the guiding passages for me during the pandemic as I started to identify and think about what is, what is my role as a pastor during this time. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The idea of let us stir up one another to love and good works happens when we meet together. That stirring up, that inspiring cooperation that happens when we meet together. I, I recall fondly the times during the pandemic, my family, we would we'd play games every night after we'd turn off our Zooms or whatever we were doing. And we'd, we played a lot of euchre the summer of 2020. We, we, my wife and I played a lot of Scrabble. We got to develop certain house rules about how often you could look up in the dictionary, what words you could challenge people on. We had to take a break from Scrabble. It was getting a little too heated. And then I would try to have my kids watch all those nostalgic vi movies that I have of growing up that had shaped my childhood and wanted to shape theirs, and they were like, this is boring. Even now, I, I think more about that line, about let us stir up one another to love and to do good works, and I find more and more that challenge as a pastor is building up people into community, and not just building people up as individuals, but building us up into community. So look at John 20 again with me and see this dangerous cliff that Thomas gets near. John writes, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, 
and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas says it. I will never believe. And that's, that's the solidness of what he thinks is always going to be as he's away from the community of the other disciples, as he's away from that moment of seeing Jesus. And isolation from the body of Christ, it is dangerous. It's a dangerous place to abide. But even while Thomas is abiding away from that room where Jesus was seen, I find it so encouraging what the disciples do. They had had that moment of being in that room. They had had that moment of hearing those words spoken of peace and seeing the crucified, risen Lord. And they had the Holy Spirit breathed upon them. They had the commission to go and forgive sins. And they went and they found Thomas. This is actually a pattern that if you look back throughout the Gospel of John, many times when people meet Jesus, the thing that happens next is they're brought more into community. Just as an example, in John chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples are traveling through Samaria. They stop at a well. The disciples go into town to get some food. There it is at noon. The woman comes to the well alone. And Jesus talks to her. And it's a great story. But here's the key part for us today, is that after Jesus talks with her, she goes back into the town. And she tells everybody what she has seen and heard and how Jesus knew me and spoke to me. And as she goes into that town and tells them all these things, they all want to know more about Jesus as well. 1 John 1, our reading today, did you notice how John writes that letter? It's we. 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 So many times the description he has of what he has seen and what he is sharing with them is not I saw this, we saw this, and I want we, you to see it to become a part of the fellowship that we have. The fellowship we have with the Father, the fellowship we have with one another, we want you to know it. The disciples they, they saw their friend Thomas near that cliff, and they went and they got this moment to speak to him. And I don't know exactly how those eight days went, but I know that Thomas stayed with them. What a wonderful illustration of what it means to speak forgiveness is to bring people into the embrace of the fellowship of the body of Christ. And so then on that eighth day, when they're in that room again, Jesus appears, he speaks the words of peace, and he invites Thomas to place his hands in the wounds and into the side. And Thomas, who had earlier said in his isolation, I will never believe, says, my Lord and my God. Jesus' death on the cross involved taking upon himself our isolation. He brought himself into unity with our struggle. He spoke those words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, he takes that same isolation into the darkness of the tomb. And on the third day when he rises again, and listen to how many times either Jesus or the angels at the tomb say, go and tell. Go and tell. Because you see, the love of God that's revealed in Jesus Christ, it brings you into community with others. Jesus is offering this peace, speaking these words of forgiveness, and bringing us into his safety, his refuge, his love. And Now, at the beginning of the sermon, I said, I hope that I transform your vision of the word peace. And so, if you have that word peace in your mind and you... You need a scene to place with that word peace. I hope it's vibrant and humming with people. It's a place where God's word is being shared. It's a people where some are vibrant and full. Others are weak and struggling, but somehow they're all together. Peace is not found in loneliness and isolation and separation. Peace is found in the body of Christ. Peace is found in the unity that Christ brings 
having gone through from that isolation and that suffering into life for eternity. Just final, the book of Revelation. Every time you see a vision of the glory of God, you'll notice there's people there. And not one or two, but a multitude. Part of what happens in Revelation is that vision of the peace of the glory of God being revealed is found in many nations, many languages and tribes gathered around the throne, seeing the Lamb of God who is worthy to open the seals. And at the end of Revelation, when the new heaven and the new earth comes, a key detail in the new heaven and the new earth in the city of God is that the gates are open so that the nations may come. image of the city of God is a place where people are invited, where it gets busier and busier and busier. Not quieter and quieter and quieter. So as you think about like maybe this last Easter and you heard all that brass and you heard all those people, or maybe you're thinking, my house is quiet now though. In those moments, when you aren't surrounded by people, when your house is quieter, even in those moments, know that in the body of Christ, with the angels, with the archangels, with the whole company of heaven, you are always in your faith, a part of the body of Christ, a part of the gathering of the saints. The peace that God provides to you, it does bring you into community. Whether it's a community you see easily every day, or it's a community that you hold on to by faith, knowing that is the promise of eternity. I promise to you that the peace that Christ speaks is a peace that brings you into the busyness of the kingdom of God. May this be peace which keeps and guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus this day and each of your days. Amen. Please stand now as we confess our faith. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your word, that we may grow in maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to those ordained for your service the gift of the Spirit, wisdom that comes down from above, and grace to faithfully fulfill their holy calling where you have placed them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. We also please ask that you would bless the ministry of Water to Thrive as they change the lives of the needy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Build up the households of your people, that your holy children, begotten in baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. We especially give thanks for the upcoming baptism this afternoon of Eliana on this afternoon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, give your presence and comfort to the trouble in our midst. We especially lift up Don Schultz as he recovers from a successful heart surgery. We also ask that you be with Ray Virigi, my mom, 
as she undergoes a heart procedure this Friday. Comfort also those who weep with the blessed joy of Easter morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of the risen Christ, you give us the crucified and risen body and blood of our Lord in his holy supper. Let us taste that the Lord is good and continually grow until salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace, for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the blessed sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and the forgiveness of sins. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily believe your word and through the Holy Sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Be with the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with the, all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing.
Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins this do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Now go in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.